We're good? Hi. Greetings. Thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, a, few, a few moments ago, we were crammed in a, a very small, small quarter, so now it feels like everyone's just kind of spread out very, very far away. Um, I'm Jason Mojica. I'm the editor-in-chief of Vice News. Um, keep these introductions uh, very short, but we're, you know, we're here to talk tonight about uh, privacy and secret, secrecy. Um, joining us uh, on my left is Alexander de Croo. He is the pri uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium, and all things telecom fall under his remit. Um, next to him is Bassem Heider. He's the CEO of Channel IT Group, uh, started in Lagos, and they're a leading telecommunication vendor uh, across Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Uh, next to him is Congressman Daryl Issa. He's a re Republican from California. He was the chairman of the House Oversight Committee and a, a thorn in President Obama's side. Uh, <laughs> Salil Shetty uh, uh, is the uh, Secretary General of Amnesty International, where he's perpetually shaking things up. Um, and uh, last but not least is Amira, who told me not to even try to pronounce her name, but I'm going to try. It's uh, Yahyaweh. Yahyawi. 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 Yeah, getting there, getting there. Um, she defies biographical description, uh, uh, but uh, she, has, she has many things. But this is her fourth uh, talk today, and she, and she says she's tired of hearing her own voice, but, but, I like, I, I, I like but none of you are, so we're going to talk to her anyway. Um, she's a, a hacker. Uh, an activist, uh, a rebel rouser, um, all, all of these things. Um, but <clears throat> so tonight we're here to talk about privacy and secrecy. And, and these are two very different things, but what they have in common is that they relate to privileged information. And now all of us, privileged information has a value. All of us trade in it every day. Some of us uh, in, in banal ways by simply giving our name and email address to a, a social, uh, you know, something like Twitter and Facebook. Um, governments, uh, governments that are represented here at Davos sometimes engage in surveillance and espionage in order to gain information to protect its citizens or for a good old fashioned strategic advantage. And uh, others use little nuggets of information gleaned from private conversations uh, here in Davos to inform future investments and, and things like that. So just as a bit of uh, get, just as a bit of getting to know each other, I'd like to just do a quick speed round of like a, a simple yes or no to this question. Um, should the government be allowed to read people's emails? Alexander. Um, if I'm not a suspect, no. <laughs> if I am a suspect, then yes, if there is a warrant. But otherwise, no, no way. Awesome. I think if the governments ask for the permission of the people somehow to be able to do this, then yes. We'll come back to the how you pull that <laughs> And off. I'll explain how. <laughs> Congressman. Well, I guess I would answer, similar to Deputy Prime Minister, under the U.S. Constitution and the Fourth Amendment, yes, absolutely, with a warrant duly sought and received by an independent judge, yes, you can. Otherwise, no, you can't. Sir? Um, yes, if we can read the government's emails. <laughs> <laughs> Now you've gone too far. <laughs> Actually, you can. You can. Namira? <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but wait, let's, let's go back to uh, Bossom. How, how does that work? How does this sort of uh, permission that we grant, are you talking about granting Let's government permission to read our emails? The world is changing, okay? Initially, uh, all before the refugee crisis and migration across borders <coughs> and so on, it was you know, quite simple to say this person is a suspect, that person is a suspect, right? And then try and snoop and find out more information about them. Today we've seen it. I mean, you cannot never know who's a suspect or not. So somehow there's got to be a mechanism where government to protect the citizens of its country without 
using it for obviously oppression and abuse and so on, and this is where they go over the line, right, is to uh, be able to somehow create some sort of a forum where if you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to hide, and therefore there's a mechanism for it where you're eliminated off that list somehow. Now, we, don't, we are not going to solve that problem here today or, or figure it out or exactly how to do it, but the reality is we're not going to stop governments doing this. We can debate and say we don't accept, but that's not going to change the fact. So rather, we should actually try and find better ways. Um, if we have nothing to hide, what are we concerned about? Amira, we, we Amira, give our Amira has nothing to hide. Uh, yes, do you, do you because mind if the it's a perception. It's a perception. Yeah. We call it snooping. Now, but if a private company says we'd like your information so we can provide you better services, you would give it willingly. Why would you do this on one side? You, you never know where the information ends. But when it comes to government, because we have a, a distrust with governments, therefore we feel that information shouldn't get there. But well, we know it does. Let me ask a question. Isn't that then a similar in that you say if the people shall give, but you're talking about individual. When was the last time the government ever came to you and said, I would like to read and have access to all of your documents uh, that's not the way government works. Government seeks to get 51% of people to support something, and then after that, they take it from 100%. So if you're talking about an individual request, uh, not, not I, the last time I saw that was when the IRS asked to see my backup paperwork. Not, not uh, and, and by the way, they were very selective in how they looked at it. Look, today you can, you can uh, write a petition in the UK and you get one million people or 500,000 people to sign up. They don't want Donald Trump to come into the country. Now, we know that there's 500,000 people and you can gather data on those people. So, in a way, you could create a forum where people willingly could give their information if they wanted to. You leave that to the people to decide. We know the government will still snoop. Are we gonna let the question other is folks? how much do we give them? Right. Uh, Alexander, you want to get in here? Well, maybe just one element on the idea of I have nothing to hide. I find that a strange concept. I mean, I have the right of private thoughts. And some of those private thoughts might be, yeah, might be some really thoughts that the general public doesn't accept. I think I have the right to do that. And so it's not about do I have something to hide or not. It's about the idea of, and, and that's the idea of, of mass surveillance. So we've always in the past, when one person, and I will just pick up the person right in front of me, if we think that you're a suspect of something, you can get a judge, as you said, to have a warrant and we can listen to you because we believe that maybe there is a, there is a threat. That's actually the fifth, which is where Mr. Issa has a problem. Okay, but <laughs> let me just finish my thought because um, the, idea, the moment you start doing continuous mass surveillance, in essence, what you're saying is, everyone's a suspect. So how and is that, that is completely different. The moment as a government you say, everyone's a suspect, well, then you're in essence in a totalitarian society. And I don't think we should ever accept that. And that's completely against any human right we've always fought for. But in, amongst the public in Belgium, have attitudes about that changed since the Paris attacks? You know, very often that is the argument you get. It's to fight terrorism and, and you know, there might be in the public some lone wolf which we never heard about and that way we're going to stop him. I have not seen any case of that up to now. All the people that were involved in the terrorist attacks, all of them were on lists. And they were on lists because they visited certain mosques that we, were, uh, that we were looking at because they were in certain groups and so on. So the idea of you need to spy on the whole public because there might be someone who's in his cellar, just in his basement constructing something, I don't think that's a good reason because it's not proven as a reason up to now. Got it. If Salim? I can, uh, Jason, yeah, I, I totally agree with the... I totally agree with the... Actually, normally Amnesty doesn't agree with government spokesperson, but I agree with the... <laughs> Belgian pri you know, we are prime Belgian, minister. It's a bit different. <laughs> but I, I grew up in India, and my father was a, well, he still is a very uh, sort of firebrand journalist. And this was in the 80s. And uh, you know, he always used to tell me that because he was very critical of the government, and he always used to tell me that our telephone in Bangalore, in the south of India, is, is tapped. You know, there was this kind of wiretapping of the telephone. 
And I always used to think he's bullshitting because, you know, he was, I just thought he was just trying to pretend to be really important about uh, this stuff. And then uh, one day there was a leak in the newspaper, uh, there was an article in the newspaper which actually somehow they found out the list of all the telephone numbers which were tapped in Bangalore. And 33854 was number one on the list, which is our phone. And, and the reason I'm saying this to you is, you know, governments historically always, I mean, if you look at all the emperors who used to rule the world over the years, they have a very detailed intelligence network to find out who's their opposition. That's how they rule the world. So it's one thing about, you know, trying to find out these terrorists who are trying to, you know, upset uh, you know, national security, etc. But the majority of what mass surveillance and intelligence is used for is to curb dissent, is to kill the opposition. Uh, that's what Saudi Arabia has done with Raif Badawi, who wrote a blog against in just expressing his freedom of expression is all he was exercising. And this is the biggest concern in this debate. It's not about, you know, some small number of people who are involved in potentially terrorist activities. It's about mass surveillance. And, and it's about governments who are using this whole anti-terror opportunity to kill the opposition, to kill dissent, to kill journalists, to kill freedom of expression. That's the core issue. And 96 countries, according to surveys, have now already created legislation to curb civil society space, to curb free expression, to start attacking human rights defenders. And technology can't be a new way of killing freedom of expression. That is the issue in front of us. Yeah. Okay. Amira, you want to jump in? I think, um, I think the Paris attacks uh, teach you that's a lesson. Um, per France is not, as it says, uh, to be a country where um, personal, uh, personal information are that protected. And um, I, was, I, was, uh, I was stateless in France. I was banned from my country. I, I, I used to live in France. And at that time, they knew everything about what I was doing in that country. So, and I wasn't at all a terrorist at the time. So, uh, what... <laughs> At the time, now I'm becoming. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, but but what was very interesting uh, after the Paris attacks is that these guys will, were enlisted, and still with that, they put a hell of a time to find them. And you see a real failure in terms of intelligence. What does that mean? It means that the intelligence that France, at least, had was about the people and not the bad people. So with this idea of mass surveillance, when you see at the end, we are all surveilled, okay? We, we know, not, I mean, our emails, everything, whatever you wanna say, our phone calls, uh, you, we know what the NSA did in the US. And I mean, I live in Tunisia, you know, we have, we have a story about this. Uh, the US is the only country where when you ask for a visa, you don't need to bring lots of paper to explain who you are, because they already know. <laughs> so, it, 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 literally, I go, I just fill the, bla the thing, I say, okay, where are you going? I'm going for that, okay, here is your visa, because you're cleared. Well, if I wanna go to Belgium, it will take me this, kind, this amount of papers to explain who I am. And this is because we know it. I mean, the, the U.S. surveilled the Germany, uh, France, uh, Brazil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this mass surveillance is showing uh, the failure of the intelligence system, because also, and this is, I think, uh, I mean, we've seen it after the Paris attacks. Uh, policemen in dictatorships, for example, were very good at surveil political activists or anti-dictatorship anti uh, activists. And the moment we started having Daesh putting bombs in a hotel, <laughs> in the beach, uh, in the museum, in the parliament, they couldn't stop them. They didn't know they were there. So we, through the years before, we prepared our intelligence against the people and not the bad people. And this is something very serious that we need to talk about. Something you've been involved with in Tunisia is uh, trying to kind of serve a, a watchdog mechanism mm -hmm. on, on the government. And I wonder if you think that conducting that oversight and pushing for greater transparency actually 
leads to more secrecy. It leads to people just finding new ways to keep information you know, close to their vest. If people are just afraid uh, uh, to say anything interesting on the telephone or an email, and, and, and information actually starts getting confined to a smaller and smaller group of people. No, because you, uh, people love to talk. So uh, I don't think uh, this stops. I mean, look at what happened lately with, uh, with uh, Sean Penn and, uh, and the drug dealer. <laughs> People love to show who they are. And uh, no, I mean, I, I, come from, I'm, I, mean I, I, I used to run a transparency NGO where we were surveilling uh, the governments. And, um, and it was very interesting when I compared my work to those who work in democracies and especially in all democracies. Uh, Myself, who was coming from a dictatorship, talking to people who only lived in dictatorship, most of the MPs never, ever, I mean, no one ever experienced a democracy in my country, were more keen to pass a law, and it passed, to um, protect whistleblowers than my friends who work at my society or other NGOs in the West, in, in the UK, in the US, or uh, in, uh, in other countries in Europe. We, we were more keen to do progress in terms of privacy and transparency rather than those who, were supp who are supposed to be the big democracies. Mm -hmm. So, and this is showing the fail of a system because we're, we, I mean, the West, I would say, and these democracies think it's, uh, the job is already done. Yeah, we don't we, need to re-question ourselves. It's because we take it for granted. Yeah, and it's, and take it, and it's taken for granted, yeah. absolutely. And I'm shocked. I mean, uh, I know we're talking about privacy, but we'll look at what the French are doing now. They're trying to get two, ty uh, two types of citizens, the, Fra the real French and the French others. And uh, no, one is, no one is contesting that. Everyone is okay. So what I'm really um, uh, shocked and um, impressed, not impressed, shocked by, is how those who live in democracies are more keen to let their democracies fail than those who actually know nothing about democracies. Mm -hmm. Congressman Issa, what about uh, in the United States? You've done a lot of work on uh, the Freedom of Information Act there. Are, are, are uh, people who are subject to that law uh, just getting better at hiding their secrets? Well, uh, I, I first of all would say that we did massive uh, uh, whistleblower expansion fairly recently, and that's a constant struggle, even in a democracy, because your whistleblower normally is somebody who's on the inside, who is participating in effectively some form of wrongdoing, and the law attempts to ensure that they're not uh, retaliated against, except the natural tendency, even in bureaucracies and democracies, is that in fact, oh no, we want to keep our secrets, including what's done wrong. This happens with police, that happens with taxing organizations, and so on. Uh, and we, we continue on a bipartisan basis. It's not, it's not one party or the other to try to open it. In the case of Freedom of Information Act, uh, something passed all the way back with Lyndon Johnson, we just got out of the House a, a very expansive piece of legislation uh, that attempts to open up, as long as it's not classified under the technical term of secret, um, a bias that is 100% toward you have a right to see it unless it's specifically withheld, and we want that to be the exception, the rare exception. And we went even beyond that and said at 25 years, everything's open so that never again will somebody hide in perpetuity anything, and they'll know that. Uh, but that goes back to that question, do you want to read your government's emails? The answer is of course. Uh, do we in government be, have to be able to have candid conversations so that it not always look like some open presentation for television? Of course. You can't have compromise if, as soon as you say, I could give here, you get hate mail. But I, I do think that for all of us who are trying to balance this, each time there is an event, like the Paris attacks, is the best time to say, are we doing the failures that actually led to this? Again, people who were suspects, people who were radicalized, people who had been to combat and come back, uh, prepared to kill, people who came in through a system circumventing uh, existing uh, protections. If we concentrate on those, well, we're slowly thinking of any changes that might actually affect privacy and the status quo and expectation, then we probably do a good job. And I say that as someone who, after 9-11 in 2001, 
we rushed through a Patriot Act and we have three times now had to make changes, each of which pulled back some of the excesses that occur after 3,000 of your people have been murdered. And so there is a challenge, and the challenge is, in democracies, people will react after a tragedy and say, make me safe. In time, they will say, what about my liberties? We have to make sure that we think about the liberties while people are screaming for safety, and about safety when people think that liberty means you don't do anything. And that is a balancing act, and I think it's why two of us, uh, specifically in government, are saying, of course, there has to be a way to get private information in a criminal investigation when there's uh, just cause. But I think more and more people in government know that uh, protecting liberty in democracies is every day telling people that their safety will never be 100%. If you want 100% safety, you live in a dictatorship. If you want liberty, you have to take some risk. But can I just, so, yeah. just to come back on Congressman, I think on the process which you're proposing that, you know, let's make it very targeted, let's have an independent judge to sign off, I think we, we would agree with that. But on the other point about, you know, we have to respond to the public screaming, I, I mean, you're not saying you should respond to it, you should take the liberty side, take a long-term view is what you're saying, but the, the argument is often given that, you know, uh, the public after a, after a major attack want you to do something. The public actually screams about a lot of stuff at different points in time. And I find leaders very selectively choosing what they hear people saying. And this is a big part of the problem. We've done surveys, an extensive survey on this question of public perception uh, on, you know, on privacy. And the data we have across 13 countries shows that at least 70% of the population, almost in most countries, it's not exactly the same number, say that, you know, Privacy is absolutely the most important thing. And this is obviously not immediately after an attack. This was done at a point in time. And the same about technology companies. The view, generally held view, uh, is that privacy is really important. And, and we, I'm not talking about privacy in a kind of libertarian way, you know, in that sense. It's, it's, all, it's just basic stuff, you know, that you don't want your, your personal stuff to be exposed and misused. It's a kind of basic human decency. That's what you're expecting. Um. Bossum, to that, to that note, you know, you, you've mentioned that you certainly see situations in which a government uh, may have the legal right to access privileged information uh, uh, of, say, mobile phone users. You know, you run one of the largest mobile networks there. Everyone in, in Nigeria, for example, everyone's using it, including Boko Haram, presumably. Um, but outside of that legal search, what do you do to protect your customers from those who are unauthorized? Let, let, me, let me clarify my view of this. I, I'm not saying I support mass surveillance and so on. This is not what I'm saying at all. And I, what I'm saying is today we focus about governments monitoring our emails and phones. But in reality, before emails and phones, they were still monitoring. They monitor through your tax, through your movement, through everything. I had, a, I had a thing recently in France where I got a big tax bill on a second home I have there. And I was like, why? He says, ah, oh, but you know, you have furniture in the house. You bought this furniture from this place. This is your electricity bill and so on. And my sister just stayed there for a month and they assumed I was resident. So obviously, if they're not checking emails and they're not checking phones, they're checking something else. So which means they have been checking this for a very long time. Can we fight this is the question. Do we have to find a mechanism to be able to work with this is the issue that we have at hand. My experience is from mobile, the mobile business and so on is, and this is very le relevant to emerging markets, you know, Africa, Middle East and so on is, when we ask people for information, they give it to us. Okay, more than 90% of whom we ask information for give us the information. Now, this information helps us to provide them better services. So someone has to always ask, why is it that on one side they're willing to part with very sensitive information, and on the other side, they fight against it? So this is the first thing we really need to debate. If you uh, today know how the credit scoring companies work, they have access to everything about you. Your credit card spends, all your bank statements, everything without you even possibly knowing about it. So that's another thing. I mean, your, your information is ending up in private hands, in governments perhaps, 
One way or the other, they're getting the information. So yes, we can fight and we can, you know, we can scream about this, but I think we need to find a better mechanism and governments need to come out openly and explain their policies a lot better because it's like we're constantly trying to say, you guys are snooping on us, snooping on us. And no, 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 we don't, we don't, we don't. The denial factor is what's making even people more and more against the issue. And that's, that's what I believe. Please. I, I wanted to come back to what you said about um, if you want safety, go to uh, you need a dictatorship, which is totally not right. Uh, I'll give you an example. I mean, if you take Syria, which is a dictatorship, it's really less safer than uh, than the U.S. For example, which is democracy, and um, and this is this. Do you comes remember when Hafez Assad was there? Hafez? Yes, Hafez is still there. No, Hafez Assad. The father. The father, he killed thousands of people. Yes, but only those who opposed him. If you wanted to be safe, you just had to put up with the dictatorship. Oh, no, 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 no. My point is that in dictatorships, they do provide people absolute safety and oh, no. no freedom because you have no freedom to object. In democracies, you have to have a freedom to object. You have to have the privacy to come together to conspire against your government this in is, legal this ways. Is, this is a shortcut. This is a shortcut because uh, what you said is in dictatorship you are safe and I'm saying no you're not safe because there are people who are dying and killed by dictators. But I'm, go I'm going to move but on you know just to say you one to, thing. You know what you need to do to be safe in a dictatorship and, which and, is stay out of politics. The, um, real, okay. the, real, the reality is that in a democracy being in has to be, we have to protect your ability to be in politics just as much a, in a democracy. The it's fact safer is, to be in, the, in in a democracy then. That's right. So you have, what what you're sure you have one person, just, one person who's sorry. in politics, and then but everyone just, else who's what, just my uh, point is, subjects. Is that we we need to deconstruct this idea of we need to uh, to violate uh, privacy <laughs> or freedoms so we are safe. I give you an example um, today. The, uh, the Americans, the biggest number of Americans dying is not because of terrorism. They are dying because of cancer. They are dying because of car accidents. They are dying because of guns. And thousands are dying every year because of these reasons. Maybe 100 per year is dying because of terrorism. So uh, to say that we need to just lose our freedoms because of something that is less important than uh, the trade-off is has no sense. The trade-off we have a lot more uh, more to lose because we will give up our freedoms rather than just give you uh, or uh, I mean give to governments the right to violate our rights just to be safe. I, I guess I but, wonder why is it you have a problem with my agreeing with you. May I agree with you. Okay. <laughs> Alexander, you, know, you wanted to jump in the, here. The, rea the reality is true safety comes from a functional democracy in Absolutely. which you have strong privacy and you take the risk that the conspirator who will do harm mm -hmm. is mixed in with, in our case, 318 million people who, who, do, who do give up their right to privacy by yeah. putting a Facebook post and doing lots of other things, but they do so on that willingly. And when they want to have that private conversation, <clears throat> including talking about politics, they can do so. Absolutely. Our challenge is when we were attacked, and I lived this firsthand, I was a new congressman just out of the electronics business, we were attacked and the American people strongly supported make us safe and through their elected officials and through popular appeal at the time, they said, we do whatever you need to do. And Congress gave the president authority okay. to do some. He immediately seized vast additional authority that we knew about and even more that we didn't know about. And it, it is now 15 years later, two presidents, and we're just grabbing back what the part we know about. So the, as the oldest democracy sitting next to the largest democracy, they're both fragile. One generation that gives up its freedom will give up a future democracy. Absolutely. And, and it's one of the reasons. I, you know, look, I, I visit dictatorships. I have no desire to live in one. I don't even have a desire to be one. Uh, the fact is, I love, I love what we have in the way of liberty, and I'm scared that in the name of security, 
people will say, well, the old rules don't apply. When King George would go into people's homes looking for venison and then charge them with poaching on the lands that had all the deer, okay, of course he found criminals and he could justify that he was only arresting the criminals, but he was doing so by violating all of their privacy. We in America have had a long tradition of, of privacy protection and we're constantly being told it doesn't apply in the electronic age. It applies more in the electronic age. And I agree with you. We give it up all the time, but it's a quid pro quo. If I don't want a credit card, I can still pay cash. If I don't want to do certain things, I can do it. But, but and, and, you, you're back to the point that you know that's what people are calling on. And I think that's a leadership moment. Let's, I think first of all, I don't actually subscribe to the view, as I said, our data doesn't show that, but let's hypothetically say that that's what's called for. But I mean, maybe we ask the Belgian deputy prime minister because they have faced real threats in the recent past. Uh, and they, I mean, I know that you had to tighten some of your rules and your behavior, but you could have gone the whole way, right? And, and taken away a lot of the freedoms which people had. And you made a leadership decision that that's not the route you want to take. I mean, we could do a, you know, hands, uh, just show of hands here if, the moderator allows me to do that. Yes, please. Uh, how many of you would say that you, you, you know, you're ready to give up your privacy in order to have security? I mean, just a show of hands. How many of you think pr security is more important than privacy? The, I, the, think, the question I think it's is a false some dichotomy. Of your privacy. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a false dichotomy. But if you are in a position that you know you have to make a choice, then no, it's, would, I think in this room it's okay, who's courageous the enough to actually put their hand up. No, I saw, three, I saw three hands. There are uh, two. Well, and how many of you will four. give out information to get an iPhone, for example, in return? <laughs> no, Basim, the, Everyone, right? <laughs> no, I, I think that's that. Basim, on that point, I think there's a basic difference, right? That's, I think the congressman said that. It's different when people are voluntarily giving information. It's, it's a totally different picture when the government or companies are surveilling without people knowing it's happening. It's not a choice. Yeah. That's, that, exactly. I think that fundamental difference needs to be exactly. clear. I think one of the issues is that I think the, the, the sense of what the, the dangers of a lack of privacy in Europe, I think in the 60s and the 70s, we were very, very well aware of what it was because we just had a Second World War right before. The reason why, for example, in Belgium we have identity cards is because the Germans installed them during the war just to be able to identify people. It's one of the few things that you actually kept after the war. But, um, so people were very much aware of the dangers. Um, I think that... I'm of the generation that actually, you know, I was born in 75, so that's a long time after the war. Um, I'm particularly sensitive for this topic, but most of people from my age are not, because they've never seen what could actually go wrong. And so after the terrorist attacks we had in, uh, in Paris, yes, in government, we had long discussions about this. And very often you have people who say, yeah, stop with all those arguments, stop with all those legal arguments about when can you do a house search and so on and so on. Let's just do what's necessary. And that sounds very well. It sounds very good. And on the short term, it's maybe the nice thing to do. The problem is that who is defining, let's do what is necessary. I mean, that's a very subjective thing. And we've always had a system with laws and, 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 and judges and constitutional courts who from time to time pull back a political decision and say, no, you are wrong, this is the basic, uh, the basic rule. But I think this type of debate, we need it more often because we didn't have those debates anymore. We, we have taken all our liberties for granted. We've taken for granted that we can have our thoughts and just discuss those thoughts without, uh, without using violence. We've taken for granted that we go swim in the same swimming pool, men and women, We've taken for granted that uh, we can fall in love and even two men can fall in love and there's actually no problem with that. And we also take for granted and when women walk around with a shorter skirt that we actually might appreciate it but behave, right? And, and, and all those things we absolutely take it for granted. And from time to time we get confronted like, wow, not everyone agrees and it's good that this debate is taking place. Now, what about government privacy, the government's right to privacy, or secrets? I mean, can you talk a bit about the role of secrecy within government? What is the need for such secrecy? Well, I think in, in, in general, most 
I mean, most governments have openness of, uh, of documents and, and um, you have different degrees in that. I mean, there's a certain type of communication which is just out of the open and everyone can ask it. Earth, uh, other things can be questioned by members of parliament and then other things which are part of the, the, uh, the intelligence services and so on. We, at least in Belgium, have a small group of members of parliament who can basically investigate that. I think that's that's quite a good system, and I think up to now it's been working. Uh, it's been working well. The real issue, of course, is is when you know when you are in a situation like right after the Paris attacks, and and you have a discussion, do you need to do a lockdown of a city or not? And and this is in a crisis situation, and and they give you information, which is not 100% transparent, and I don't I don't ask that. I mean, the only choice you have at that moment is to trust what the intelligence services are telling you. But I have to say, I never felt very comfortable in doing that. But you have no choice. I mean, you cannot ask for a second opinion. You're under time pressure. So you just do it. But from a conscience perspective, I hope a lot of my colleagues had the same feelings as I had, which was, OK, we're kind of forced of doing this. But I don't like being in that kind of, uh, in that kind of situation. Congressman, what's, what's your take on this in the States? I mean, in, in some, you know, I, I grew up in, in Chicago and, and uh, live in New York now, and... Uh, are, you, so are you making a contrast on the two democracies? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one is a dictatorship. And, uh, um, I mean, yes, I've born in one party system. Uh, it's, like, it's like Mexico in the, for the past 70 years. Um, but, but, but seriously, folks, um, sometimes it's, it's it feels not, like it's Americans. Not the second city and everything. Right? <laughs> Americans, it feels like a lot of us have given a lot of power to the U.S. government and just kind of asked that they keep us safe and, and please don't tell us the gory details. And, and meanwhile, there are certainly other people who believe in a radical transparency and who believe that uh, we should know everything that our intelligence agencies are doing, even at the risk of causing us further harm or opening us to harm? I mean, how do you balance these things? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I pride myself on being a Republican in the sense that I'm a part of a republic. Uh, we have a system in which we, we consciously in our constitution made a decision that we would, among the many people, elect people and ask them to ensure they knew everything on our behalf. And I have the honor of doing that. So the elected representatives of the American people must have unfettered and full access to the executive branch from the top of the presidency to the bottom of the bureaucracy with very limited exceptions. And does, not, that, does that happen? We try. We try very hard. Uh, you know, uh, the gentleman here noted that on television seen around the world, uh, a person who had... Uh, brutalized uh, nonprofits in the U.S., professed her innocence, said she broke no regulations or rules, and then took the fifth. But of course, she had testified that she broke no regulations or rules. So there's a public debate on that. But the reality is that was part of a process in which uh, we had hundreds of depositions under oath of people both in and out of government. And they they were investigated. We asked for, and to the extent that hard drives didn't magically on the same day disappear, we, uh, we got information. Do we get it all? No. It's a struggle. Uh, is the system perfect? No. But is it my responsibility as one of 535 members of the Republic to continue to push to get that balance on behalf of 318 million Americans? Yes, that's our system. Now, I also believe that I need 318 million Americans helping me. Uh, I, I funded something called the Open Government Foundation, and, uh, and I continue to fund it, and it, it gets a lot of independent Knight Ritter and other groups funded too. <clears throat> but we try to get governments to put more of their information, <clears throat> not just in a little form they put online, a PDF, but in searchable uh, format so that every bit of the detail is there and there before they vote and there while they're deliberating. And it's a struggle and it'll continue for the rest of our lives. But the fact is, 
the government knows more about us than we know about the government. And that trend is dangerous. It's not just dangerous in the sense of the high ranking, it's dangerous in the size of the bureaucracy. The people who decide if, you pay, if you've paid your fair taxes and the information, were they looking at you because they don't like your politics or were they looking at you simply because your sister stayed in the place for a month? If, if, it's, you know, if we don't know, then in fact there can be tyranny within the bureaucracies. Uh, look, I look at, at France, I was in Paris and I looked at the holes in the door and the scrapes in the walls where those bullets penetrated and, and where a lone policeman went in and killed one of the, of the four. Uh, it's no surprise that there was martial law effectively for a short period of time, that people understood that the police would take over, they would contain people, they would violate the normal rights for a short period of time. The question is, how in a democracy do we ensure that it is a short period of time, that it's measured, and that as quickly as possible people get back to their normal rights? If, if there is a fire, I want them to break down every door to see if somebody is in there unconscious. But if there isn't a fire, I want them to go get a warrant before they break down my door. But Jason, I mean, this is where, you know, so what happens is if something like the United States, the way the U.S. behaves, is being watched very closely by countries across the world, right? So, so if the U.S. is using drone attacks to kill uh, suspected terrorists in Pakistan, ending up killing, you know, grandmothers, little children, then you start figuring out what are the checks and balances on this system of using drone attacks. And when, so when you ask that question, you'll be told that this is a national security issue. We can't tell you, you know, what's the recourse? What's the remedy? There isn't one. So the balance has gone completely the other way. And if you, if you told me, say, a year ago, if you had told me that, asked me which governments are surveilling the Amnesty International system, I would have expected the Chinese are probably surveilling us in some way or the other. The North Koreans, if they have the capability. In June this year, we discovered that the British government is surveilling Amnesty International. No parliamentarian in the British parliament would be aware of this fact. You're talking about checks and balances. The British government, and we, we got it through a legal process. We are now taking it to the next level of legal, legal battle. They are surveilling uh, UNICEF, Amnesty International, South African Legal Resource Center. We are all terrorists now, or what? Well, if you have nothing to hide, what are you so concerned about? Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, so the nothing to hide one is, you know, the, and also the other argument given is that we are just collecting the data. We're not going to use it. So yeah, I mean, it's like saying, you know, let's put a camera in people's bedrooms. We're never going to actually use it. We'll just film everything, you know? So I mean, th this is, where do you push this argument? You know, where does it end, really? So we have to be really careful. I think, and- You know, that's uh, rippling through this crowd, that thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, I mean, so when we have these discussions here, it's an interesting academic, you know, it's just a conversation. But on the ground, you know, when Egypt arrests 12,000 people, put them in prison last year, anybody who's remotely considered as opposition is in jail, you know, even if suspected people. You know. And so that's what happens in practice. Once you start surveilling emails, you start going through people's records, these governments are doing really bad things. And that's the real issue. It affects people's lives. Uh. Let's, let's not wait till the very end. Let's, let's uh, get some questions in from the audience now and go back. Who's first hand to shoot up, right? This gentleman right here. He's fast. And uh, uh, please, please uh, state your name and affiliation if you have one. And uh, <clears throat> obviously, a uh, obviously a very popular man. But also let's try, let's try you know? to refrain from uh, 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 manifestos and platforms. Just questions would be great. Stefan Kaiser from Switzerland, those are my students. <laughs> um, I think you've been missing uh, a point here. You've been uh, talking about the confines of your own countries, but I think that's not the reality anymore. And particularly with digital age, um, it's just as easy to snoop on people abroad. And I think Mr. Shetty has just started to allude to that when he was talking about drones in other countries. Um, you know, what stops governments really from snooping all around the world and start um, using that information on people abroad. Um, there's no checks and balances on a supranational level um, protecting us. 
So yes, yeah, good question. So what stops governments from snooping on people abroad or uh, how do people protect themselves or their citizens from being snooped on by foreign governments? I can answer one part of it from, again, I do try to only answer on behalf of the United States and then recognizing I'm only one of 535. Uh, we, have, we have what we identify as a US person in our, in our law. So when an American is identified uh, including a green card, a permanent resident, in an overseas operation that may be allowed, that material has to be, what they call it, minimized, but it in fact goes off limits. Because the, the idea that you boomerang through overseas espionage, surveilling your own people, is in fact something that the United States has dealt with in the, in the past, and you cannot use information you glean from outside the US under a different set of rules. Your bigger point, though, is what stops every nation from saying, as part of the global war on terror, quote unquote, each of us is going to make sure we snoop on the other one and then effectively share the intelligence uh, to make each safe. And it's a, it's a real concern. There does need to be a recognition that each of our democracies, at least, uh, has to be held accountable not to participate in effectively undoing domestic laws. It hasn't, been, it hasn't been a subject that the great democracies, quote unquote, of, of Europe, United States, Canada, and so on, have actually come to grips with. Uh, as to drone strikes, uh, I had a, a man who worked for me uh, for many years before, uh, till the last two years he retired, but in fact, he was a sniper who had Osama bin Laden in his sights and did not get the kill order. He was literally in that group from the CIA. I don't know that he would say there's any difference between a drone other than what often is called collateral damage. Uh, but the reality is that war is ugly and once a, a people authorize use of force abroad, they've made a decision to violate another country's rights. Uh, and that is going on, uh, but it's going on with everyone in this audience probably belongs to a country that's participating in it and the rules are not well defined. I do think it's not within the scope of what we're dealing with here tonight, but it's certainly within the scope of how long and how will democracies allow this to go on? How much will we invest in over 10 million displaced Syrians rather than having an argument about migration? What are we doing to deal with a, a, a disaster of these people caught up in a war zone. I want to get to Alex here. So, so how does Belgium protect its citizens from being spied on by allies, Fr friends and allies? Well, <clears throat> we'll it's hard, it's hard to, you want me to say we do it in a good way or in a bad way? Um, well, that way would be better. More for entertaining for us. Anyway. Well, no, the, the, the whole, I mean, we, we've had uh, one case of our um, a big telco that basically came out that, uh, well, there's a Belgian telco who has a company that is, is called Bix. It's doing the, the, the wholesale uh, for the whole of the Middle East and, and a big part of Africa. So obviously that's an interesting, uh, interesting company. And yes, it seems that there had been infiltration. The whole question is, did we agree or Infil not? Infiltration by who? Infiltration, well, I, it's not not defined. The Germans, but based but based on the <laughs> no, based on the Snowden slides, you could infer something. Um, the whole question, of course, is and 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 even me. I, I mean, I'm not the minister of justice, so I don't get access to to everything. I mean, my question was, did we agree or not? It might very well be that the Belgian intelligence services said, yeah, why not? Please go ahead. And and so the whole question is, who is who is giving an okay to that or not? And, and, and actually, I do not think that this is something that um, you know, the whole of government needs to, needs to discuss. I think there needs to be a few people who can, who can be trusted in making a judgment call there. And those people need to be people for whom you're sure that you know, they cannot be compromised, they, 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 they know the, the, the rules. You know, in, in, a, in a society from time to time, you have to give trust to some people. And, and that's how a democracy works. I mean, a democracy works on trust and it works on humans, and humans make mistakes. Okay. So will we be de debating this in 10 years again? 
I'm pretty sure we will. And, and, and democracy is something where you're navigating all the time. There's no perfect democracy. Um, but on the, the question on doing it ab abroad, I mean, we, we all know that, that in the IS territories, I mean, there are services from, from Western countries who are active, obviously. Is that something that you're allowed to do or not? Well, it's, it's under the condition of, 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 of a war and, and of protecting your own, uh, your own, uh, your own population. Um, so you said, on your you question... But you suggested that you didn't know whether or not the intelligence services had allowed that. I myself don't know that. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure that some people in government uh, will probably have made a call on that. And I think so you're that... you deputy prime minister and telecoms kind of falls under your watch. And yeah, you but don't. this was, this was, um, this is foreign telecoms. So it was not on, on the domestic, uh, on the domestic network. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. not bullshitting myself out of yeah. this. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is that for these types of, for these types of things, there's a few people who know about it. And there's a few people who need to make a call from time to time. And if there is really a problem, okay, then you could confront them with that. But the idea of, you know, everything should be completely transparent and open for everyone. I don't think in the world of today this is, this is something that is feasible. Can, I, can, can we ask wait, for a poll? We? The polls have been helpful because we've gotten nothing. We'll do a poll <laughs> and we'll go to Celia. If, how many people here believe that your government, whichever government you belong to, should in these areas in which ISIS is growing and planning and threatening, whether it's Syria or other countries, your government should be in fact spying on ISIS in order to keep you safe? How many people believe that should happen? Looks like, for those who can't see at home, the large majority. And, and, and that ultimately is what democracies do respond to. Alexander has to cut out. He's, he's not just. You're leaving me alone. This. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for joining us. Well, here's, so, a, he, here's an interesting thing, though, is why would we accept that we could spy on another human no matter what? and we would not accept to be spied on ourselves. That is the big question we need to ask ourselves because we feel that provides us safety, but also safety or insecurity could be hiding within us and we're not aware of it, and the proof is what happened in Paris, which comes back to my original point is there should be no differentiation because if you're gonna spy on ISIS, which are maybe 30 or 50,000 people, you're actually gonna spy on all of Syria to figure out who those ISIS guys are. You cannot say, I have the database of 50,000 people and those guys are gonna spy. If you have the database, then you don't need to spy on them because you already know who they are. So the question is, I mean, why would we accept it to be done on certain places and not in our countries. But, but as you, as you, sorry, sorry, as you know, off. that is actually what happens, is you get a suspect, I'm you follow that specific communication, uh, and there are thousands of leads related to ISIS that, that foreign uh, US and other nations intelligence are following. Uh, they don't look at everyone in Syria. There is, there's enough bandwidth. They look at areas where they think that there is. Uh, but again, I have a constitution that says, I cannot let my government spy on the American people. I have to respect a 240 years of law and constitution that protects people's privacy. I have no choice. Salil, so, can, can you I tell us what respond. you think the baseline should be for rights regarding privacy? Uh, I was going to oh, yeah. say exactly that in relation to the question, because you know, there, there's in international human rights law, we follow the principle of necessary and proportional. And that forms the sort of foundational principles on which these decisions are made. So, and you're absolutely right to say that we need to have some norms and standards. We are in a new space here. And so now we have a special rapporteur for the right to privacy. So we have the rapporteur already for freedom of expression. Uh, and there's a whole debate on uh, countering violent extremism. So we need to bring all these pieces together. Um, and to have a set of standards which, which I agreed. And this is also, there's another discussion about industry standards. So for example, when the first Egyptian revolution happened, Vodafone turned off the phones, and, and Basim will know a lot more about, as a telco operator about this. And there was a whole debate as to why did Vodafone suddenly decide to do that without having anything in writing from the Mubarak government. So GSMA, which is the uh, tel telecom sort of association, has also come up with standards. Now, 
on the political side, of course, the standards, the enforcement of the standards has to happen through the UN. And as we know, the richest countries in the world don't necessarily listen to what the UN is saying. So often what happens is the sec even the Security Council only has power on poor countries. I mean, if, it, if it's happening in, even in Russia, they really can't do much. If it's one of the permanent five members of the Security Council, the Security Council can't do anything. So it has to be relatively weaker, you know, if it's Central African Republic, the Security Council can go and thump its, you know. Even Syria, now it's become the playing ground for all the regional and global powers. We're watching. So, so there's a big question. We need norms and standards, we need international principles, but who's going to enforce that? Mira, you want to jump in? I mean, uh, you know, we can, we can do lots of polls. Uh, for example, I will ask this room. There are 10 ISIS in, uh, in Switzerland. Are you all okay that we spy on you? Who's okay that we spy on all, all, all Swiss citizens? Okay, there are only five. So it's also always easier. It's always easy to spy on others than, than their hours. It's always easier to be okay to... Um, to throw in the garbage the human rights of others than ours. And this is, this is totally normal, but this is why I think it's very, we are in a very interesting time. We are in a time where we can re-question ourselves about the meaning of democracy, the meaning of human rights, and the meaning of universal human rights. Universal human rights doesn't mean that I come from a country that is very powerful and can, by my incredible constitution, uh, uh, protect my rights so I don't do it on my citizen, but I can do it on other citizens, that they don't have a country that is as powerful to protect its citizens. So today we're talking about this uh, open, uh, this uh, Davos 2016, and we're talking about this fourth industrial revolution. And one of the words inside the forum that has been a lot discussed is the word globalized standards. And when we talk about globalized standards, we're talking about globalized standards for uh, autos, for, uh, I don't know, industries, etc. But it's real time to talk about the globalized standards for a human, for us. Okay. And... <laughs> For me, uh, for me, what I'm what I'm seeing, and this is this is the difference, is that you, ha you we had a vice prime minister, we're having a congressman, who are not allowed to information while they are elected, while the bureaucracy has the right to know, and the people who are appointed to the most critical critical places, which is the head of the NSA, for example, the head of CIA, the head of the uh, Belgium intelligence, are not elected. They are appointed. So those who decide on very fundamental things and those who have all the rights and have all the power are not elected, while those who are elected, they don't even know what's happening. And this is why it is time to discuss what is democracy? Is it the dictatorship of bureaucracy? What is that? Let's get back to the audience. Who's, uh, good, good job. Who's got a question? Let's go, to, let's go to the left side of the room. I don't mean that politically, just geographically. Thank you. My name is Thomas Yuli. Uh, Congressman, I have a question. If you find out that one of your best friends, your buddies, is spying on you, what would you do? And why could it actually be beneficial for your relationship with your buddy that he continues this practice? Maybe why should it be different for governments? So somebody is peeking in the window of my house and taking pictures with their iPhone, and you want to know if our friendship will remain strong and, and happy? Not so likely. <laughs> the, uh, the, the answer, though, and I'm going to pivot to her question, her statement, it was a good one. We do need to have standards for a great many things, and we need to globalize them. The f way that sovereign nations, though, globalize standards is through voluntary acceptance and treaty. And so whether it's your question about would I let somebody peek in the window or not, and would it affect our relationship, well, it, did I leave my window open? Did I say, look in on me to make sure I haven't fallen uh, before? You know, if you just want to walk in the front door, walk in the front door because you're my friend, I can have that discussion. But as we try to get the 
first world, and I'm not saying economic first world, but the first world of democracy, of human rights, of rule of law, we should be in fact forming treaties about what we will or won't do commonly in the way of protecting our people. When I came to Europe this time, I went to France, I went to Belgium, and then I came here. Those other two countries, like Switzerland, are part of visa waiver, a situation in which we know a lot about the country's ability to tell us if there's a problem with a citizen who might want to come to the US. As a result, the stack is very short. It's very simple, uh, either to have no check at all or potentially, if you've been to a foreign country just recently, uh, in a very limited group of them, to say, well, we may want to have a little bit more, but we're still going to mostly make it very quick and easy for people in our countries to go to the other country. That's because we have effectively a treaty relationship, an agreement. So I would call on everyone to ask their country, why are you not negotiating with the United States, with other members of the EU, to ensure that we do in fact agree to common standards as to your country versus another country, France versus Germany, United States versus each of the members uh, of the countries here. And if you're from a dictatorship, maybe we don't have that treaty. If you're an, a, a country that spies on America, that steals secrets, that is constantly trying to undermine, maybe we don't have that. But for much of the world, we could establish these best practices of protecting against unfair intrusion uh, in people's privacy. And that should be a goal that tonight we look and say, how do we get more countries to treat each other the same as we treat our own citizens? Uh, and it's part of what the trade promotion is and trying to negotiate is at least data retention. But just looking at it from a human nature perspective, what would inspire any government to give up an edge that it has? I mean, we can set all this, you know, best practices that we want, but uh, I mean, any country that could be a hegemon in, in, in one way or another certainly would be. Uh, so what's, how do you incentivize compliance with something like that? Or how do we um, regulate it, enforce well, well, there are two things that will get a democracy to do something. Uh, mutual self-interest will be done sometimes even over public opinion, and public opinion. If, uh, if people in the United States say, of course I want to have uh, a recognition that Ireland will not spy on me, that Germany will not spy on me, that France will not spy on me, then I have to be willing to tell my country that they need to have a reciprocal understanding. Now that might mean that when the United States has a serious concern about somebody, they go to the French government and ask them to seek a warrant, that ask them to, to do a portion, that cooperation. Uh, but we're, we're not gonna get there until people first agree that what you give to the internet, so to speak, is your decision. What is taken involuntarily and unknown from you is in fact something that the first world has long ago said we shouldn't do, and now little by little in the name of safety, people are doing. And the debate, as the Deputy Prime Minister said, the debate will go on for 10 years from now, but if you want to maintain your freedoms, you're going to have to speak loudly for them. I think uh, you know, we are in an interesting situation now in relation to the tech companies. So when we started this debate with them a few years ago, we were not on the same side. I think because they felt that you know, it's still not an issue, you know, the whole issue of the right to privacy. But now they're starting to feel more pressure from their customers as well. And I think there, there's a real point of leverage to change their behavior. So encryption technology, for example, which is one of the best things that you can have in place to protect your privacy. I think more and more companies are more open to it. WhatsApp is pretty good on encryption. Uh, some of the others are not. So I think as users, we can start putting a lot more pressure on the tech companies. And the same with backdoors. I don't know how many of you follow the, the conversation on this, but essentially a backdoor is when you're allowing governments to peep into your databases and your customer data. So you know now, and I think even the companies are now, Facebooks and all the big guys are starting to say this is problematic, you know, and they're starting to challenge governments more. And I think the more pressure they feel from you guys saying that 
this is not acceptable for us. I think that will, because the, the thing about back doors, of course, is you think you're opening the back door to some government on a specific piece of information. But actually, even the so-called terrorists whom governments are so scared of are also using the same back door. So it's just a disaster all around, you know. So I think, but I think pressure from the people, I, I don't believe that any government or any company has, well, maybe I shouldn't put it so strongly. Rarely do governments or corporations change their behavior without pressure coming from outside. We've got about 10 more minutes, so let's uh, take another one from the audience. So this this silver-haired gentleman has had his hand up since the very beginning. All right. I may regret it, but let's give it a Two shot. questions. <laughs> the question for you, you are a friend of Obama. Obama, when he came in power, he said, yes, we can. Now at the end of the period, we know, yes, we can. This is a difference. And I come well, to I another. Don't to, I don't want to interrupt you, but you didn't hear the introduction. Ah, this, uh, sorry, was I'm a mistake. I'm the nemesis. Ah, of OK, president. sorry, I give it back. It was a mistake from my side. I come to a question. It's not only security. We become like a consumer. If you go into the internet, what you do, your whole behavior is registrating. And you, we, we buy, we live, we are informed. We become like a consumer, not a personality. We become like an object. And this is a great danger, not with personality, an object, a consumer, and a slave. And I have another question. Obama, uh, Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. Obama said, now I have a drone. And this is a big difference. <laughs> and this is a question to the committee, to the Energy International. When you survive everything and you're killed by this, is also a big problem because you have no security by your own, because you don't know what really happens. Though these have two questions in the deeper sense, information in the hand, like in a god. Who, who is doing right, I'm, this? I'm, okay, I'm going to try, I'm gonna try and synthesize that. <laughs> I have a uh, Don't leave the one-liners out, though. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I have a drone bit. That's good. Uh, what I heard somewhere in there was, uh, was that information about what we do is turning us into products. We are being bought and sold. Um, uh, is that so wrong? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Amira's got a view on it. Uh, those who speak French here, uh, do you know who's Etienne de la Boissy? I should learn that in school. Uh, this is a young guy, French guy, who wrote a book called um, La Servitude Volontaire, the, uh, the Volunteer Servitude. And this is what we're doing. Um, I, uh, I tend to always say it's the government's fault. But sometimes it's the consumer's fault. And in what you raise, the fault is ours. We are bought and uh, sold because we accept to be bought and sold. Uh, we are servants in the hands of uh, companies. When, you, when we are OK to give our private, to give, uh, to give uh, our privacy, to give our information, to give our photos, to give everything, then we should not complain after. We are the ones who accepted that. So um, I think, I mean, uh, uh, there are, there, it, it's a dual discussion. First, there is the problem with the top. The top is using internet and blaming everything on internet. It's because of ISIS, it's because of internet, I don't know who is because of internet. And we, citizens, are also blaming everything on internet, while we are also uh, doing our own harm, actually, to ourselves. So uh, I think something that you can take to your home is to read this book about uh, the volunteer servitude, and you will hate yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Who's next? So what we have. Uh, way I, in the back there. Could I weigh in with just one thing? Uh, go, I, for um, go for it. Go for it. Before you start, we'll let. I just want to weigh in very quickly because uh, you have premature gray hair. I I assume you just don't remember that at least in most countries when you bought a house or bought a car even a generation ago, even in the 60s and 70s and 80s, as soon as you did so, everybody that sold curtains when you bought a house solicited you. Everyone who could sell insurance and car uh, accessories solicited you when they, you got a new title for your car. It is not new for you to be an object of public information for the sales force. 
the question is, are you willing to, uh, to delete emails because someone's soliciting you or to put them in the spam? Uh, in some ways, this is, a, this is not a new question. It's simply a question that it's now cheaper to send an email uh, when they discover something about you and try to solicit you than it was a generation ago when they had to print something and send it to you. And that's one of the reasons we're noticing it is it's practically free to react to data and bombard all of us with the output of it. Vice News is selling ads against this live stream right now, so you are all <laughs> being commodified. Uh, to the gentleman in the back. Yeah, so my name is Chikan Pascopilio. I'm also Mr. Kaiser's student. And... <laughs> <laughs> Extra credit. Yeah. So let us assume that the population, so we are willing to give up, also y'all on stage, we are willing to give up our privacy, which also includes our secrets. Is the government also ready to give up their secrets? So, for example, conspir con conspiracy theories, which are spreading through the World Wide Web, so that we are able to solve this pro, uh, these theories. So what do you think? Who wants to take it? We'll leave that to the government <laughs> officials. To, to <laughs> <laughs> Ladies first. I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure this is because you're <laughs> for gentleman reasons. <laughs> so, um, I, I mean, I think, um, I think governments are for now a bit smarter than we are, uh, and that's weaker than governments. And this is something that we should look at ourselves in the mirror and uh, ask ourselves why. Why are we willing to give up our secrets? I'm not assuming, it's a fact. Most of the people here do have a Facebook account with their photos, etc. For me, it was a question, you know, that should, I, should I put information online? I think, and I, I've been a hacker in the, at least 10 years ago, and, I, and we can, uh, whether you hide it or not, they are able to know. You know? And this is also another problem. And we're not pressuring for that. So there is a, like a volunteer servitude that I would add also a fatalism we're facing, because we cannot uh, really today, we are not today really willing to like take the fight and do it. So we keep on voting for people that we know are corrupted, for example. We keep on voting for people that we know are pro-anti-privacy uh, while, while you can be pro. We keep on doing the same system and we keep on uh, explaining democracy the same way. Democracy is supposed to be the power of the people. Do you feel powerful? I don't think so. Um, I mean, maybe not Switzerland, because you're having your referendum, etc. so this is completely different. But from people in other countries where actually uh, in our life, in our daily life, we do vote for everything. I like chocolate or I sh like milk chocolate, I like black chocolate. I want uh, to this doctor, I don't want that doctor. But one thing, we elect a president for four or five years, and during four or five years, actually, we're, we're out of the game. We already elected that guy. So uh, what is happening, I think, and this is why uh, technology is also a very good thing, technology is disruptive, is dis uh, disrupting the power of the elected and the, those who have power. It is, it is changing that because we are not the native uh, tech babies. But the new ones who, who, who know the true meaning of democracy, who, who know the true meaning for them, it's normal that they can choose everything. And they have the right to decide on everything because we cannot uh, give that argument of it's impossible to do a referendum. The Swiss have been doing referendums forever with papers. So now with technology, it's always easy to decide. So, that power of, I gave you the power, I voted for you, and during four years, you are the, or five years, you are the one who is deciding for everything, is not working anymore. And I'm, I, we, we experienced that in Tunisia and worked very well. Now, uh, when an MP should vote for whatever article it is, before that, there are 24 hours where people can vote for that article before. So the MP can be against 
what the people voted for, but it's so transparent that he cannot just go then and vote for uh, the opposite that 90% of the people voted for. So it is, I mean, uh, technology is also a great tool because we are re-questioning everything with it, and maybe in a good way. Salil, you want to jump in? The, the question was on secrecy, though. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think to that point, I'd like to say something because Salil's too genteel. I, to just I don't. I mean, we can question governments as much as we want about information and so on, but I don't think realistically we're going to get everything. And I have the proof to that. Recently, I was trying to read something about the conversations between Tony Blair and President Clinton, and other governments and so on. And what has happened is it was so redacted. You said, "Hello, Mr. President." and then, oh, I'm fine, and nothing, and then you had another word there. So in reality, is they release information, but you couldn't make any sense out of it. No matter what you tried to do, it was totally redacted. So there will be a lot of questions that we can ask, and a lot of information, and be it conspiracy theory or whatever. The reality is, if the information is not meant to be given to us, then it will not be meant to be given to us, and it will never be given to us. So, from a, from a human rights perspective, sort of Amnesty International's position is very clear on this. So, when it comes to individuals, we always advocate for maximum privacy. When it comes to governments, we our position is that there should be maximum transparency and accountability. That's where we stand on that spectrum. Now, the question, of course, is are there exceptional situations where the government can withhold information for national security, etc.? That's legitimate, it can happen, but the process is increasingly unclear in most governments as to how this happens. So it is the, it's incumbent on citizens to hold governments accountable. They are servants of the citizens, not the other way around. And in many countries in the world, the people become the servants of the government. So we should never allow this to happen. We should keep that, that space of where they can claim that you know, this is a matter of public security, et cetera, should be minimized, absolutely minimized, with very clear process. And to try to answer your question from a US perspective, but I think it applies anywhere in the world, when it comes to what you should know about your government, uh, and it, all of the people are saying there is some legitimate holdback, but let me just say it this way, because this is something the Open Gov Foundation and other organizations, Sunlight Foundation, other groups I work with, are trying to get people to understand. And I'm going to use a hypothetical. 99% of what government has, you should have access to. It should be there even before you ask for it. If, there, if, if the government pays a dollar for something, there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to know who they bought it from, how much they paid. It's your money. If there's a bidding process, of course, they can keep it secret so that it's a blind bid. Once the bid is open or finished, you should be able to open it up and see what everyone bid. This kind of transparency, the, the vast majority of what you don't have now, if it's systematically made available in computer searchable format and the entire, in my case, 318 million Americans have access to it, then we can begin arguing about the 1%. But the lowest hanging fruit is the vast majority of what government does that they simply don't bother to make available to you. And then you'll go through a long and expensive process to get it, uh, whether you're the New York Times or uh, a congressman or an individual citizen. That's what we need to make available. When you get that, you begin making a democracy make much more honest uh, statements because and, and I'll, 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 I'll use Nigeria because I was there only a few months ago as an example. Nigeria was losing half a billion dollars worth of oil every month for sure between when it was taken out of the, the ground and when it got sold. And they knew they were losing it. Holding accountability is opening up the books so that the, the people understand that. That, by the way, not just helps the citizen, it helps undermine Boko Haram, who talks about corruption, because it's hard to admit that it isn't there. Of course it's there. We've got time for one last question. He was the first one to get his hand up there. Um, my name is Mark Miller, um, another student of Mr. Kaiser. <laughs> Thank when, you. When anyone <laughs> who's you. not a student, please raise your hand. <laughs> uh, now, 
it may be uh, it may not be a very popular approach to the to the subject and uh, Miss Yahyawi <laughs> she um, she already mentioned it and um, that is the, the, the amount of money we spend on a program which is uh, absolutely not um, backed by the population so it's unpopular and if uh, the government were really concerned about our safety then wouldn't it make more sense to reallocate this money we spend on those programs and put it into for example cancer research or, or um, traffic safety what, what sort of programs are you talking about? Um, well those surveillance programs mm, okay. of course um, and uh, it, this question also implies um, that there may be also uh, another motivation for the governments to survey its citizens despite the safety. And um, if you think that this is um, true or this is a fact, then what are those reasons? Thank you. So Switzerland, famously neutral. Uh, are they safe enough to just kind of stop uh, surveilling uh, its own citizens for... You asking me? Anyone, anyone who wants to jump in. No, no, I, I, I totally agree because, you know, this is a kind of knee-jerk reaction that when there is a problem, then governments have to show that they're doing something so they just throw the kitchen sink at the problem. And it's not about the money which you're spending only on surveillance. The real big money is going on indiscriminate bombing. So you, you have 9-11, then you attack some empty rocky spaces in Afghanistan, then you bomb Iraq, and then later on you start figuring out what really happened with that, you know, and this is not, this is not, 9-11 is just one example, I mean, we constantly are doing this, you have a problem, that's why the question about is it necessary, is it proportionate, uh, what is the basis on which you're taking actions is very, very important. And I think from a standpoint of money, uh, I'll bring up a program that most countries have, it's enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, it's required, Every 10 years, the United States performs a census. Now, to some people, that's an intrusion. You have to say who you are and where you live. Uh, and there are a, a massive amount of questions that are in our, the US census that allows us to understand people, their, uh, their backgrounds, uh, their national origin, uh, their, their race. Now, we wipe away the individual information, but we keep the cumulative information. And it's expensive, many, many, many billions of dollars. And yet I think most Americans enjoy the fact that they're constantly able to find out what the population of their city is, what the population of their state is, when we allocate for, uh, uh, for uh, welfare and other social programs, we do so based on income and population based on the census. So not all that government does is nefarious. Not all that government does is against terrorism. A great deal of what happens uh, happens because, in fact, it is in the public interest. And I'm going to close with this. You can go online and you can get the CIA fact book. It's public. It's this thick when it's in paper. And by the way, you're, you see it used every day for populations and per capita GDP and arable land of countries, every country in the world. There are some things that we spend money on that are in the public interest and it does take a little bit of our, our privacy, but it's handled normally so that it doesn't take individual privacy, it strips that away. And again, that's part of what we as citizens have to do is we have to insist that our governments collect information in the public good, and minimize the loss of our privacy, something that I think, at the end of the day, is your right, and you should not be ever forced to give it up unless you choose to. Can I just Amira? Just, uh, Amira wanted to jump yeah. in here, actually. No, I just wanted to okay, quote, no. just to finish this point, just to quote from the Guardian newspaper, just uh, William Binney, who is a former technical director of the U.S. National Security Agency, told a British parliamentary committee earlier this month, this was just last month, that the British government's plan for bulk collection of communications data tracking, which is everybody's internet and phone use, he said are 99% useless because they swamp intelligence analysts with too much data. It's absolutely not cost effective. So, I mean, people who know a lot are also saying you need to be doing really smart collection, not random collection. We're, we're over time, so Amira, last word to you and then we're done. 
I, I'm going to return back to my uh, globalized standard logic. logic. Um, Saudi Arabia beheaded as much people this, uh, in 2015 as Daesh. More, Ex more. more people, more people than Daesh. Saudi Arabia treats women as, as bad as Daesh. Saudi Arabia is a hell for uh, populations as much as Daesh. Saudi Arabia is bombarding Yemen, killing casualties, collateral damage, uh, hundreds of people. Uh, 2,500, oh, I love Amnesty International. Uh, as, <laughs> as much as Daesh, these people are uh, uh, even more. But Saudi Arabia is an ally, Daesh is not. Okay. So, that, uh, the Islamic State. Okay. So before, ISIS. They, before, so, so before Gilbert uh, brings out the cane and starts pulling us off, we have to cut it off. Uh, Saudi Arabia is an ally to all of these countries, all these democratic countries, ISIS is not. And somehow, I wonder why. And I think because ISIS is not doing a lobby as good as Saudi Arabia. All right, thank you very, very much for joining us this evening, and thanks to everyone watching at home. Let's give a hand to our guests.